All right, everybody, this is for all of you who are thinking about going to the Western Hunt Expo in Salt Lake City, February 13th through February 16th. I want to give you a shout out and let you know that I will be there and I would love to meet all of you. I'm also going to be doing two different seminars, one on Thursday the 13th at 4.15 p.m. and one on Sunday morning at 11.15 a.m. the 16th. And we'd love to meet you. We're going to be talking about mentorship, conservation, and primal adventure and what the next generation of hunting looks like. So don't forget to, if you are showing up to the Western Hunt Expo, to swing by those seminars. Make sure you set a reminder, put it in your calendar, and come say hello. We're also going to be uh, swinging around the show throughout the weekend. So make sure to catch us, drop us a line, let us know if you're there. We'd love to chat with all of you, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast and enjoy this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you soon. Stay soulful. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I am your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I am on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. Tonight, I have just a wonderful and amazing episode for you with one of my local state of Washington heroes. When I first got into hunting, this was a guy who, when I searched state of Washington hunting, his videos were popping up all over YouTube. I really connected with them. They inspired me. They motivated me. And from his content, I pursued even harder and further. And tonight, it's just my honor and privilege to have him on, Shane Shane Vandergeesen from the state of Washington. And we are going to be talking about how he got into hunting, his journey of becoming a hunter, along with his pursuits in the backcountry. This guy is an absolute killer when it comes to blacktail, alpine deer, uh, black bear. And he's also a huge fan of solo hunting, which on top of that, he films his own hunts. So that has its own challenges. We're going to dive into all this tonight. So it's going to be a great um episode all focus around the backcountry hunting so shane thank you so much for coming on man yeah happy to be here yeah we're glad you're here as well tell the listeners a little bit about yourself who you are where you're from what you do yeah so i'm uh, my name's shane vandergeesen like you said uh live and grew up in linden washington which is about as far northwest in the state of washington as you can get I'm one of those, you know, a mile from the Canadian border type, your cell phone's on Canadian service as often as U.S. service type location. Um, see, I, I'm an insurance agent by trade, but, uh, you know, I, I'd rather focus on the hunting side of things. It's a lot more interesting than insurance. So, um, and grew up hunting. My dad was a was always a, he was a big time elk hunter, archery elk hunter, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. So I always grew up every single September with my dad gone for a couple weeks of the month to be elk hunting. And just couldn't wait to uh, to get into that with him. And uh, when his kids came, came of hunting age, he started bringing us deer hunting. He would go rifle deer hunting, so we wouldn't crack into his elk season. Um, and uh, <laughs> so kind of did a lot of rifle deer hunting with him. And his elk hunting spot burnt up and kind of went to crap. So now I actually have never shot an elk yet, which is funny. But, um, but yeah, so got into hunting from a young age and just uh, – it was immediately drawn to the backcountry. Like that's especially the Alpine. Like I just wanted to get away from people. If I don't see another person in my hunt, that's a, that's a perfect hunt for me. Um, and if I'm in the Alpine, you know, above tree line, I don't care if the hunting's great or not that great. You know, I'd rather shoot a three point buck up there than a, you know, a mediocre four point on a logging road or something like that. 
so yeah, um, yeah. So that's how I got into hunting and uh, been doing it. You know, as I got kind of into my adult age, you know, I have friends I hunt with plenty, but um, I do a lot of solo hunting as well, just because it ends up working out best for my schedule. And quite honestly, I enjoy it sometimes more than hunting with a partner. Um, my wife doesn't always enjoy it as much because <laughs> I'm, I'm. She <laughs> likes to know where I'm at and stuff like that. But you know, with today's technology or you're in reach and that sort of stuff, we can at least stay in touch with people, which is always helpful so oh heck yeah no my wife she was like solo hunting you're not doing it and, <laughs> and whether i can or cannot and i want to honor my wife and make sure that she feels confident in what i'm doing as well so absolutely you know what they say happy wife happy life <laughs> yep and when i come home from my hunt i want my wife to be here also and so yep. <laughs> i want to make sure that everything's taken care of <laughs> i love it so okay you've never shot an elk Never. No, I've been elk hunting, I want to say a lot of times, but five or six times and just never connected. Um, I had a great hunt down in New Mexico when I was 18 where we saw like 50 bulls in a week of hunting and, you know, had five or six bulls within 50 yards. Just what, you know, didn't come together in any of the situations. So um, it's still on my bucket list. I have a hunt plan this November in Idaho or not Idaho in Montana. So I'm excited for that to uh, try out, you know, try to get a late season elk, which I've not put a lot of effort in, but um, it'll be, it'll be an exciting experience for sure. That's cool. And that's going to be a rifle hunt. Yeah. So it'll be rifle for deer and deer and elk in November. That's cool. So uh, do you archery hunt at all? Because all your videos I that I, I watch, it's see most of you have a rifle in your hand. Yeah, I'm I'm an opportunistic hunter, so I get a you know I get a multi-season tag every year, um, and uh, just so I can have the, the longest season I can. And for me, it's whatever weapon's going to give me the highest chance of success. That's the weapon that I'm going to be using. So in archery season, that's the only weapon you get to use. But when, once rifle season hits, I'm you know I'm going to pull out the rifle and try to have success. You know why hamper yourself and limit your success with a with a weapon that's harder to have success with. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Have you taken uh, the bow and tried to hunt your alpine blacktails much? Yeah, so my biggest buck actually, my I have a, uh, I think it's like a one to one forty five buck that I shot with a bow um, in the alpine. So that my biggest buck was with the bow, and then my second biggest was with a rifle. Ironically, man, that is it, for those of you who are listening to this podcast, you got to check out Shane's YouTube channel and check out his content on Instagram and stuff because. It is going to blow you away with some of the stuff that he has been able to accomplish in his hunting career. And it's super impressive to not only be doing that, but also being a, a husband and a father of three. Thanks. That's, that's, <laughs> quite, that's quite an accomplishment, man. So, Shane, what, what, how, what age were you when you started hunting? I started hunting, I think I passed hunter safety at eight years old. And then my dad took me the first two years I wasn't allowed to carry a rifle. And he was like, if we see an animal that's that's legal and I have time to get you behind my rifle and set up to shoot it, you can. And that never even came close. And when I was 10, he got me a 280 um, semi-automatic. And uh, we went over to Winthrop and they had their first youth season. Um, and, you, and youth could shoot any deer. And so I shot my first deer, which was a spike buck, at 10 years old. Uh, and that kind of so cool. really kicked the passion into high gear. Yeah, that is awesome. And was it your father that got you into the backcountry hunting? Uh, a little bit. I mean, my dad wasn't as much of a backcountry hunter as I am, but he loved mountain goats. And so kind of my first experience with animals, I think I was seven years old, is he took me mountain goat hunting in the spot where he had shot one of his mountain goats. And uh, we went back there and recently, it's the Mount Baker goat herd, and recently uh, some anti-hunters had kind of pushed fish and game and said, you can't have these liberal seasons because you haven't actually done any research on how many goats there are. And so hunting was shut down altogether and there were signs at every trailhead, you know, please report goat sightings because for some reason people thought goats were endangered. And so my dad was like, well, let's go up, see if we can see goats. And we went out and, uh, I think in a weekend of hunting, we saw like 145 goats or not hunting a weekend of just backpacking. We saw like 145 goats. And, uh, it was, I remember we, on the way back, we like stopped at the ranger station and go to tell the ranger. And we were like, so careful if it might be the same goat twice, we would not even count it as a goat. Like it, these were 145 unique, different goats. And 
go to the ranger station. My dad's like, do you want to tell the ranger? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like walk in and I'm like, so we went backpacking. This is where we were. And we saw the 145 goats and the ranger, I, I'll never forget. He gets down on one knee and he looks at me. He goes, well, young man, that's really cool. But I've been working up here my entire life and I've never seen more than 10 goats in a day of backpacking or of hiking. And I was like, well, obviously you don't know where to look then, do you? <laughs> and, you know, I think honestly, I'll, I'll never forget that day. Like I can I could bring you the exact spot that ranger said that to me too, because it like, it kind of just fueled this passion of like hunters, in my opinion, know a lot more about the ecosystem, what's going on out of there than around out there than a lot of people do. And just that weekend in the, in the back country, we saw a Wolverine, which was really cool. Wow. Um, we saw a bunch of goats, we saw a bear and I just, I absolutely ate it up. And I, all I wanted to do is get back out there and be, be in the Alpine in goat country as much as I possibly could. Yeah. Dude, that man, that gets us down a rabbit hole. Like we actually want to talk about Department of Fish and Wildlife and how people <laughs> view them and their interactions with hunters and and all that. But we won't go there. We're gonna we're gonna keep. We can positive. save for another podcast. Yeah, definitely, definitely another topic. Um, so you you went up, you saw goats. That was kind of like your first journey. At what point did you grow out of hunting with with family or other people and getting into the solo hunting? Yeah, so it kind of started when I, ironically, when I started dating my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, she, her family was a huge backpacking family and affected a lot more than my dad or I had ever done. And so I started doing a lot of hiking with them and was like, wow, this is really fun. Then my best friend in high school and I, we were like, let's, let's go get a deer in the Alpine. I think we tried for like, I don't know, 10 years before we finally succeeded in the Alpine. Um, you know, but I got really into that. But then all my, you know, he, my, that buddy went into medical school. My other buddy went into medical school. Uh, my dad couldn't keep up with me in the high country. And, you know, my wife isn't into hunting. She likes backpacking. Uh, and so it just kind of came down to, there weren't a lot of people that could keep up with me that had the fitness level or the desire to hunt in that country that I was hunting. Um, and so I just kind of started going on my own and my wife's big, you know, her, her caveat was that they had to have cell phone coverage. So I, I was very limited in the spots in the high country that had cell phone coverage, but I figured out, you know, the little pockets here and there that would, mm -hmm. and then those would be the places I would hunt so that I could check in regularly with her. Um, and started hunting those spots. And I found kind of multiple things. One, I had more success when I was solo, um, because you just get to move at your own pace, get to make your own decisions. You're not worrying about someone else making noise or someone else moving too much or anything like that. Um, and then two, I just found, you know, especially as life just gets busier and busier, you know, now with kids and with cell phones and with work and all the emails you're getting, all this kind of stuff, just being able to unplug and, and get away from the busyness and the noisiness of life and just kind of be on your own. It, you know, for me, it's, it's spiritual. It helps me connect with God. It helps me, you know, I'm, I'm literally like just walking around hunting and praying at the same time. And, um, I always take a Bible with me and I'll read, I'll read my Bible more out there than, you know, oftentimes I have time to, or, or probably more desire to, you know, or whatever at home. And, um, it just, that it kind of fed that passion of just, I, I love that being able to connect to reset to, to just kind of the spiritual connection with it really. <laughs> Heck yeah, that is why this podcast is called the Soulful Hunter Podcast. We we here believe that hunting is not only a spiritual connection, but it is so good for your soul and the connection with with the earth to you, to God above. It's just you create that linear path of communication and everything just flows, man. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> So one of your coolest videos that really impacted me was it's kind of an emotional one is you it's your video on YouTube called Sahali. You talk about uh, going out and it was a uh, one of your first hunts after having a stillborn child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's got to be tough. But what I really love is the quote that you put in there or actually you said when you were narrating your video it says what my soul craved was a place where I could truly listen and feel the presence of God. Yep. And that is the essence of why I love hunting. The soulful part, but also just being out there and feeling so small in this world that, that God created and yet just getting to connect closer than you ever have. And it's super special. Tell, tell everyone a little bit about your connection and how hunting has healed you or allowed you to to heal yourself through, through being out there and the difficulties you face in your life. 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say I have a difficult life because, you know, I'm blessed beyond all belief. You know, I have three healthy kids and a beautiful family and a house and a great job and all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't mean you don't have hard times as well. And what you're alluding to is our, our first child, uh, we, were, we found out we were pregnant. We announced we're pregnant, you know, the big Facebook reveal, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, 26 weeks, uh, my wife was actually on vacation visiting her sister in Montana and called me. She's like, I'm in the hospital. Um, I'm bleeding. And turns out we had a, our child was ended up being stillborn. And so it was a, it was a really hard emotional time. And for me, um, you know, I, it's hard to explain, but I tell, I was, I told people at the time and still, you know, I wasn't mad at God. That's not at all how I reacted, but it was just more like I felt shut off from God almost like it was hard to pray. It was hard to, to just find that connection. And, um, through that year, I, you know, I wasn't expecting to be able to hunt that year because we had a baby due in, in August. And then throughout that year, we, um, I was able to spend a lot of time in the high country, you know, backpacking with my wife. We went and did a trip down to the Grand Canyon and design. Um, we backpacked through Washington. My friends, you know, were by my side the whole time and were, were out hunting with me and helping me and just getting that unplugging, like I said, and getting that quietness and that, that connection with God really helped heal me, healed my soul. Um, and it helped me connect again with, with my Lord and savior, which I, you know, I can't ever be more thankful for. Uh, and then to top it off, I was blessed with the, you know, my biggest buck of my life at that point in time, my first Boone and Crockett animal. Um, and you know, it was just kind of the, the cake on top the cherry on top of the cake for the season. I didn't really care about success that year. I just wanted to get out there and, and find, you know, find that spiritual connection that I felt like I was lacking. Yeah. It seems like you had a double success. You yeah. got what you were initially looking for and you got rewarded by seeking God first. And then after that, you know, we always say on this podcast, you can't outgive good. Yeah. And when you put yourself out there and you really are working on your own self, uh, things you get rewarded. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. So take us through a little bit uh, about your journey. Well, let's go look, like backcountry hunting 101. Mm hmm. How is it that you are able to be successful year after year, or what is it that you are searching for? How do you, how do you come to find the spots that you hunt? Is it is it off season scouting, a lot of hiking? Are you doing a lot of e scouting? Um, are you coming up through a main trail and then running ridges of different locations, or how is it that you end up coming across where you hunt? Yeah, you know, for me. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot of aspects of this conversation. So for me, first and foremost, it is fitness. Um, I always felt like I can I can outwork everyone else. You know, that's, that's kind of been how I've survived in life, in school, and work, and everything. It's just like I remember in college, uh, it, we were graded on a curve. I thought it was the greatest thing ever because all I had to do is do better than everyone else. It wasn't about acing the test. It was just I had to be better than everyone else, and I knew I could do that. I could work harder than them. Um, and so hunting, I kind of just took that approach. I can work harder than everyone else. People don't want to pack a bear out nine miles. Well, I don't mind packing a bear out nine miles. People don't like to hike downhill first and then uphill 4,000 feet to where they hunt when there's where there's no trail. Well, I can do that. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the first aspect of it. And then for me, I wanted to hunt local. And it was partially because of funds. I couldn't afford the gas to drive very far. I couldn't afford the time off to go to go figure these places out. You know, I was, uh, um, I was newlywed. We weren't making a lot of money and it was, you know, my, my adventures have to be nearby. So I had basically, and I knew I wanted to be the Alpine as we already talked about. So I had the Mount Baker wilderness. So that's where I started hunting. And I just pulled out a map and said, where's there not a trail? Let me try hunting there. You know, where can I use a trail as an access point and then hike off trail, um, for a period of time to get away, get to a spot that I don't think other people are getting to. Um, and that's how it started. And, you know, when I was younger, it was just move fast because we could, um, get up high on a ridge top and walk the ridge top and just keep glassing down. And we had very little success except on bears. And that's, you know, bears are fun because that's kind of how you hunt them. You just keep moving, glass another Alpine basin where there's berries and eventually you're going to find a bear that you can go after. 
But for deer, I wasn't having success that way. And it was really the slowing down, getting off the ridge top, start side hilling, start finding where they're feeding and where they're bedding, finding, you know, the the spots that deer are hanging out. And then slowly over time, I started saving up for trail cameras, you know, start out with your $50 trail cameras from Walmart. And then, you know, maybe a hundred dollar camera that could take a video and uh, that sort of thing. And um, I would go out in the summer and I spend, I'd say probably as much time in the summer just getting up there to to look for animals or to set trail cameras or to pack salt in to put in front of the trail cameras and that sort of thing as I do in the in the fall actually hunting those animals. So it's getting out there scouting. Uh, Google Earth is a huge tool. I mean, I can't. I have a whole Google um, file of all the spots I want to go check out hunting, and within two hours of my house, I have probably 30 spots I haven't had a chance to get to yet because I'm still spending times in the other spots that I had scouted out. Um, you know, you, there's just you, you and I were talking about before we started the podcast of there's not enough time to do all the things that we would love to do. And if I could take off from August 1 to November 30 every year and hunt as much of it as I could, I would because I would and I'd never run out of places to go and things to do. I just absolutely love getting out there. Man, that's awesome. These blacktail that you hunt, you're hunting, you're hunting true blacktail, not bench leg. Yeah, yeah, they're true blacktail. Uh, I mean, they're yeah. Well, I mean, Matt Baker Wilderness is, I think, I'm trying to think. It's pretty far from the Pacific Crest. A long ways, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think every every black tail I've ever shot has been Whatcom or Skagit County and west of um, west of Baker Lake. You know, not even just west of Ross Lake, but west of Baker Lake. Yeah. Is this? Um, are you finding yourself hunting more north facing slopes, south facing slopes? It just depends just... on the time of the year. I, I mean, honestly, I've, I'd say far more often south than north but my buck this year is a north facing slope so uh just depends on time of year depends on feed it's looking for that sign you know this year there was more hunting pressure in my spot than i'm used to and the spot that i always see deer i had a trail camera down there all summer and i was just hardly getting anything on my camera and i went down there and there was hardly any signs so i was like well might as well start exploring and went i was you know normally hunting south side i went to the north side dropped down like 2,700 feet over the north side away from the truck wow. down into the timber and was side hilling through and found all of a sudden was just finding deer sign everywhere. I'm like, okay, well, this is where they're hanging out, you know? And so then it was a matter of finding a deer. And it's funny, I ended up seeing one deer bedded under a tree, um, you know, at like two in the afternoon. I could just see like her ear and her eye. And I'm watching her, watching her. And I was like, well, it's middle of the day. They're not going to be moving. So I might as well just watch this deer, see if there's anything with it. And about an hour later, I see another ear flick. So there's two deer there. Okay. And then a little bit later, by the by the time, I think it was like 4 o'clock, 4.30, they, one of them got up. And I had spotted three deer at that point in time. And then when they all started getting up and feeding, it turns out there were nine does all bedded in, under two trees. And I That's just incredible. didn't see them from where I was. And so I just sat and watched them and watched them. And they're slowly feeding through the alpine. And I'm just like, there's got to be a buck here. I mean, they're probably, you, know, I, you never know. And finally, I, you know, I was just kind of side hilling a parallel ridge to them and watching them feed. And I, every time I'd look up, they're like, okay, where were they? Let's see if I can find nine. And one time I'm counting, I'm like nine, 10. Oh, there's a 10th one now. You know, so I, and then I was like, okay, I got to go through them all, figure out if any is different. And uh, like the fifth one I look at, I'm like, oh, there's antlers on that guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then got the stock up and figured it out. But it was a spot I'd never been to. I'd never shot a deer at. I, I think I'd only seen a couple deer there before but it's just that continually exploring and working harder and farther and going further than other people do. I think on that hunt in like 30 hours, I ascended according to my GPS, like 14,000 feet elevation and hiked like 26 miles or something like that. Wow. So you really so, are, you're putting the miles on to find these animals. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Are you glassing for these deer at all in the Alpine? Yeah. Oh, I mean, for me, um, like, do you bring my, a spotting scope with you? Uh, no, not in, not when I'm hunting. And scouting, I always do, not when I'm hunting. Um, and it would have been nice on this buck because it was a three point or better high buck hunt, and I couldn't. It took me a long time to find the third point, like literally thirty minutes. Um, but uh, I don't normally take. I don't glass that far that I need a spotting scope. Um, I I actually like for me. I do a lot of still hunting because I know where the deer are and I get down to their level. And then I'm playing the wind right. And then I literally, my goal is I'll take three steps and pick up my binoculars. Three more steps, pick up your binoculars. And I'm glassing stuff. If I'm in the timber, you might be glassing 50 yards. You might be glassing 40 yards. You know, and if you're in an alpine, you might be glassing 
you know, 100, 200, 300 yards. But um, very rarely am I picking out deer, uh, you know, more than six, 700 yards away. Like that's kind of the, the fur- further distance of what I'm looking at. Yeah. And rarely are they ever going to be opposite hillside or where you could actually see them. Yeah. Well, and you'd be amazed how much like once you get that fall color in the alpine, uh, like I don't know if, if you hop on my Instagram, see the photo I posted a couple days ago. It was from that deer hunt that I was on. And those deer in their fall coats, you, they might be in the middle of the alpine. And I like there were nine deer in the middle of the alpine. And I would lose them constantly and it would, okay, sit down again. And there was only like 500 yards away from them. It was like, sit down, pull out your binoculars. Okay. There's one, there's another one, you know, and it would take me sometimes two or three, four minutes to pick out the nine deer again. And they were just in a meadow. Like it wasn't even like with cover for them. Um, you know, so you'd be amazed at how well they blend in. Now if I had a binocular, if I had a spy scope and sat glassing forever, could I pick some out? Yeah. But those deer most of the time aren't in the middle of the alpine. They're down in the brush. So that's, you got to get down in the brush after them. Gotcha. So now these are all resident deer. Mm-hmm. These, these deer aren't migrating around no. or whatever. So when you find them in the summer, you mo- you might as well find them in like a square mile area in where you're looking. Mm-hmm. I mean, they might move a little more than that, but yeah, in, in general, you're right. Yeah. You mostly they're bedding under the same patch of trees type thing. No, and- they don't. I mean, they, they won't use it. I've, almost never pick them up in the same bed. You know, I, if you find a bed, keep it in mind and, and glass it, you know, walk up carefully on it. But more often, more often than not, you're not going to find them in the same bed again, especially those bucks They're you know, they might be in the open in the summer when they have velvet, but once they shed that velvet, they go down in the brush and they're hard to find. Yeah. When you're making these backcountry hunts and, and you're after these animals, do you, are you camping more up on a ridge line or are you trying to, how far away from your hunting area are you actually camping it depends on the spot and the and the tra- and the people traffic so if you're in a spot that's a hiking trail that hikers are coming through and you might see people on the trail then just camp right next to the trail the deer are used to people being on the trail uh, i'm not usually hunting from the trail but i can camp right next to the trail if you're in a spot where you're not by a trail and you're backpacking in the middle of nowhere then setting a camp up where the deer are can be very disruptive so then you got to be a lot pickier um, and there's one mountain that i hunt that doesn't have a trail where I think the, the spot I, I have camped in the past is not an ideal spot. Like I've, I've found deer a mile and a half away from my camp, but I, you know, I have trail cams that have, that are closer to my camp and there's deer on them sometimes when I'm not there, but when I'm camped there, you don't see the deer there, you know? So yeah. it's, it's also just always evaluating that and, you know, playing the wind, right. Make sure you're not camping where the wind is blowing, you know, the primary winds blowing to where those deer hang out. And sometimes that means you got to climb every day to get deer spot or drop down every day to get deer spot, you know, it, it not have a fire so that you're not, you know, letting your scent blow around. It's, it's always, it's different for every spot. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you found through your experience of hunting these alpine bucks that most of them are hanging out on benches or are they love in the steep hillside or well, the steeper, the better it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I hunt and scout a hundred percent of the time with crap with crampons in my pack. And I, I say I wear them 95% of the days that I go out. Uh, even on dry days, um, wow. you know, I'm in steep enough country and the, it's, if it, you get dew or rain, which you almost always have in Western Washington, um, on those hillsides, you can't walk across it without crampons oftentimes. Uh, and you're this, talking legit like ice crampons, not like uh, have, yak tracks yeah, where you're just like putting on three, spikes. I have like, I'm trying to think. I have three different levels of crampons. So you have your, uh, a lot of people, the Catula micro spikes. Mm-hmm. Um, that you can just, they're kind of like a rubber gasket you fit around your boot with just some small spikes on it. That's if the weather forecast is great. I'm not expecting significant rain. Um, and you just might need it to cross, you know, a dewy hillside or something like that. I'll throw those in cause they're light. Um, but it, they break a lot, especially if you, you abuse them at all. And if you get any snow whatsoever, they're horrible. Uh, then I have what's called, uh, they're, I think, black diamond inline crampons. So they have six spikes that only go over your heel. Um, and so that's for rainy forecast. So I know it's going to be raining most or a lot of the time that I'm out there. And I'm going to be side hilling just through nasty wet stuff the whole day. Um, I'll have those along. And then I have like a full on ice cramp on, um, that has, if you're, if I'm expecting snow, uh, or the, or the possibility of snow and it actually has what's called a snow plate on the bottom. Cause those might, those inline six point cramp ons, if you get snow, it just clumps up like a snowball inside the spikes. Right. Whereas these have kind of a plastic plate under it so that the snow doesn't clump up in there as bad. 
Yeah. Uh, and that's if you're getting to like, it's got a toe pick and everything. So if you're getting to the nasty snow in, in Western Washington, what we get during deer season a lot is just this wet three, three to six inches of snow on top of the blueberry bushes, you know, and you step on it and they all sloughs away and then you slide in your side down the hill. Uh, I had one day where I, I slid like 150 feet down the hill. Uh, I also oh, have a, um, a black diamond whip it, which is a trekking pole with a ice axe head on top. And I've used it many times where I, I slide down and I catch myself using that. So do you find yourself only going up with one trekking pole then when you're doing these types uh, of hunts? It depends. So if I'm still hunting, I usually only have one trekking pole out. And then when I'm hiking, I'll have two out. So one is a whip it and one's a standard trekking pole. Nice. So in the state of Washington, for all the listeners who are out of state that hear this, we have a high buck hunt, which is in September where you can go out for modern rifle. Are you finding yourself the same type of hunting strategies or techniques for the September hunt as you are with the late rifle in October? Definitely not. I mean, in in black tail deer, the big bucks, you can you can find the smaller bucks any time of the year. And in recent years, it's because of limited time hunting, that's what I've ended up shooting, which I'm okay with. I mean, I ultimately, I'm first and foremost a meat hunter. Like we use, we eat every bit of meat that we get. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not fun chasing the big bucks and trying to have success on those. And so in September, from my experience, it's really hard, especially like September 1 when there still might be in velvet. Like my big buck with my bow is September 4, I think, and he was still in velvet when I shot him. Um, they, they, the big bucks might still be out, but some years they've, they've shed their velvet by late August and they're not out anymore. Uh, by September 15 to 25, which is high buck to see a, a big buck out in the open is very, very rare from my experience. Uh, not saying impossible, you know, cause people do it, but, uh, very rare. And so you're, you're going to be looking, you have to get down in the brush and you're going to be getting them up out of their beds. Usually if you find one, a big one, or you're looking for the small bucks. So like this year, I only had a couple of days to hunt because we had a baby due in, uh, in late November. And so I, I was just like, Hey, first legal buck I see I'm shooting. So I had no problem hunting that high hunt. Uh, but come October, the, the big bucks are just starting to cruise every once in a while looking for does. And the later you get in season, the more you'll see that. And like, I'll see it in my trail cam this year. I had, um, like the big buck in my, in my resident area that, you know, the biggest buck that's in there, it's not a huge one, but you know, it's a nice size, mature buck. You know, I got one picture of him from July one to October, like 21 and then October 21 to November 10, I have like 350 pictures of him. Mm. Um, and all times of all day, he's just walking around cruising, looking for does, you know, not in just, I don't know if they're necessarily full born rut yet, but they're definitely, they're moving and they, they get a little bit dumber and a little bit stupider. Yeah. Are you uh, hunting does early in the season or are you more no. or less keep an eye on them just later on? Well, and again, depends on your goal. This year, I was willing to shoot the first legal buck I saw. So you'll often see two, three or small four points hang out around does. Um, but the big mature bucks, they're not anywhere near the does in the early season. Yeah. Do you find yourself... Yeah, uh, going to the same locations and packing in the deep snow once you get into the October months, or are you looking yeah, at different usually, ele- I mean, elevations? Or it, it again depends on the mountain. There's some mountains where you get heavy snow and they'll move out of there, um, and then there's other mountains where they, you know, they have spots that they can get feed up there and they kind of hang out. Even when, you know, they, eventually they all move down out of the Alpine, but um, there's definitely spots that hold on a lot longer than others. So. I have kind of my backup spot where I, I know I can always find a buck like almost any given day, um, but there's not a lot of big bucks in there and they'll, they'll hang out up there until like this year I had, I think I'm still getting trail cam pictures in mid December up there of deer. Wow. Um, and, but then my other mountain where I, sh- where I shot my biggest buck, um, that one, you, you know, if you, if you get dumped with a foot of snow, you might, you know, you might get a deer every once in a while on the trail cam, but they, most of them move down 2000 feet because it's just higher elevation. I, mean, I don't know. I don't necessarily know exactly why, but whether it's higher elevation, whether it's the, the slope of the, the hills, the snow melts slower, you know, you don't know. Yeah. Are you hunting certain elevations for when you're trying no, to pick out these deer? Do you find themselves um, hanging out all over the mountain or is it? Yeah, I mean, again, depends on the mountain. Um, in Mount Baker Wilderness, there's not a ton of tall mountains. Uh, and from my experience, the deer don't cross over in mountain goat country. 
Um, you know, so I, I mentioned earlier, I like to hunt where you can see mountain goats. To me, that's the most fun. Uh, and it's really interesting if you put, if you kind of spread trail cameras out in those mountains that have mountain goats, uh, in general, this is a rule of thumb, not a hard and fast rule. In general, you kind of have an area with deer and an area where they intermingle just a little bit and then an area of mountain goats. Um, and it's funny because the feed's the same in all the areas. Um, but they, you know, I've, you'll get one trail cam. At one elevation where you'll get both animals, you'll get another one where you get only only deer and another one where you get only mountain goats just based off elevation alone. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Now, just switching subjects real quick. You said your dad, he shot a, a mountain goat in the state of Washington? Yeah, he has two mountain goats and a bighorn sheep in Washington. Is that before they went to once in a lifetime? Yeah, the sheep was once in a lifetime, but at the time they had an archery only tag. And it was like, because my dad was, was shooting a compound bow like... I don't know, in the early 80s, like right when compound bows were really first invented. Uh, and uh-huh. so at the time to get an archery tag, I think there were like 15 applicants for those tags because there was just hardly anyone archery hunting and uh, for the bighorn sheep. And so then he hunted, I think he hunted like 35 days before he got his ram with his bow. Um, and then mountain goat, they used to a lot more aggressively give tags in Washington. They kind of managed goats more like deer than like mountain goats, which was a mistake. They almost you know wiped out a bunch of herds. But you know, the Mount Baker herd, I think, gave like 40 or 50 tags a year, uh, including wow. some archery only tags. You know, so he got, I think, two archery only tags and two rifle tags. And he harvested two with his rifle. Didn't get any with the archery tags. Man, that's so cool. I know. Have you been putting in for goats ever since you got your hunter safety? Oh, and yeah. All that? Yeah. So in Washington, I have like, I think max points is 26 now or maybe 25 and I have like 24 points. So I'm like one or two behind max. <laughs> so uh, like fingers crossed. You're like, come on, man. Yeah. And then, uh, like I apply in a lot of different States. And so for me, my entire application strategy is what States has have mountain goat hunts and I will be applying in that state. So I might as well apply for the other animals in that state too. Um, uh-huh. cause my like number one goal is to get a mountain goat tag. So I apply in every single state that has a mountain goat tag. Yeah. Well, it's kind of ridiculous the state of Washington, how they max you out at 26 points. And so then once you get to 26 and you haven't drawn every year after that, everyone catches up to you on the point. No, program so that's not, you- not how there is no max. Everyone's max goes up every year. So the, the reason 26 is the max is because they've had points for 26 years. Next year, 27 will be the max and next the next year, 28. But what's really depressing is if you actually run the numbers, which I'm a math guy, so I have, is that your odds of drawing are going down every year because they square your number of points. So if you have 26 points, it's 26 times 26 names in the hat. But there's there's so few tags and there's so many people applying that even if you have maximum points – Yes, you have more names in the hat next year, but there's so many more other people names in the hat that your odds actually went down from the year before. So every year I'm not drawing this tag. My odds keep getting worse and worse, uh, which is just depressing to think about. But we need to change our draw system very bad. Well, I'm going to say a prayer for you and be like, because I need, number one, I need to watch a Shane video <laughs> when he goes and hunts mountain goats. Shoot, I'll even come and video it for you. Perfect. I'd love to I'll, help uh, you out. I've already, I have it all planned out. When I get my tag, um, I'm going to, I'm, my goal is, I'm going to balance the goal of a, of a big goat with the, with the cape, right? So like I uh-huh. plan to shoot a goat in November if I have a tag, but if I see a big enough goat in September with my bow, I'll, I will shoot it. Right. Um, <laughs> right. and I'm going to, I'm going to make a video. I'm going to write a book about it. I have it all planned out. <laughs> Heck yeah. As you should. Dude. So I, my, I ended up writing a book. I haven't released it yet. But uh, based off of my very first big game animal kill on, on a black bear, I have a story. It's all written down already. Awesome. Yeah, sharing those stories, it's good, man. It's good to write it down for your own memory and to pass it down through your own legacy. But it's fun to read other people's hunting stories. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what are some of the the primary and crucial pieces of gear that you're taking with you? My biggest one for Western Washington are the crampons, which we've already talked about. Um, I, like I, I see these, yeah, you know, I, I think people just, 
I see these alpine hunts on TV shows or videos or YouTube videos or whatever. And I'm just like, and people are like, oh, it's too steep to walk across. I mean, not a lot of people say that, but I don't think people truly realize what it's like hunting in the Western Washington Alpine, like how wet it is. Um, and I, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable going to a lot of the places I do unless I had those crampons along. So that's kind of my really crucial piece of equipment. Um, knowing your weapon, you know, whether that's your bow or your rifle or your muzzle loader, know your weapon, know how to shoot it. Um, you know, I got, I recently upgraded my scope and, uh, got a muzzle brake and, uh, got a lighter trigger pull on my rifle. And I, I just feel like I can shoot, you know, keep shooting the same hole every single time with it. Um, and each animal I've taken since I did that, it's just been one shot and it's done, you know, right there. So, um, that's, that's fun as well. Um, trying to think what else good boots boots and i i'm a big proponent because i have really weird shaped feet uh don't listen to what anyone else says about boots try on a bunch of boots and figure out what works for your feet because good boots aren't what everyone else says is good boots good boots are what work for your feet yeah um you know and then make sure you waterproof your boots so if if you've never used it get this uh, again i'm talking western washington here but get snow seal which is basically a wax you put on the outside of your boots and i do that like three times a year because otherwise your your feet are just going to get soaked every time you go out and then along yeah, with boots, wet feet is a miserable gators. hunt. Uh, if you if you've never had gators, get them because again, wet feet ruins a hunt pretty quick. Yeah, no. When I first got my hands on my very first pair of gators, I was like, oh, I see why people wear these now. <laughs> this is this is super important. But also, I went into the backcountry with the wrong pair of boots. And I had giant strawberry sized blisters oh, on my heels because the they worst. were boots that people recommend, but they didn't fit my feet. Yeah, it's the and worst I was thing destroying ever. Destroying myself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so Shane, what's one of the biggest struggles you face when it comes to hunting aside from being a husband and a father and the time aspect? Yeah, it's definitely time. I mean, time is your biggest battle always. Um, but outside of that, it's kind of that mental game of like, if for me, if I haven't scouted well, um, then I start. Quite, are there actually deer here? You know, are, is the game actually here? Am I in the right spot? You know, and I tend to be impatient. One of the reasons I like hunting in the backcountry is because you have to move a lot, and I like to move. I don't like sitting. Um, I don't know how I do. You know, in the classic mule deer hunts where you have to sit in glass for hours a day every single day um i've never tried it so i don't know but you know uh so if you're not if you're not confident in what you have there then it's hard to to stick a spot out when animals aren't moving because what's you know at least what i can speak for with alpine blacktail is there are there may be a lot of animals in the area and you can hunt that area six days in a row and not see an animal or maybe see a doe and that's it and then go out another day and see four bucks um, you know, they're not consistently in the same area, you know, but if, if you're not out there, you're not going to find them for sure. Right. Dude, that self doubt. Am I making the right move right here? Should yeah. I be going left instead of right? Oh, dude, that kills me all the time. Yeah. Something that, uh, definitely is a challenge. So moving forward, what, what's your plan on besides the, the mountain goat hunt, because mm -hmm. that is like the ultimate. Yes. W what, what is your goal every year when you set out? Are you like a black bear? Is it always black tail? Do you ever feel like mixing it up and not hunting the same locations? Yeah, it, it changes every year. I basically take inventory, you know, I mean, you, you understand this because we talked about it already is that like, I, I think about hunting every single day, every single day of the week, you know, I, that's what I'm thinking about all year long. And so I'm looking forward to that season the, all the way until season starts. And so I kind of take inventory again every winter and what are my goals going to be for this year? What do, you know, what's my year look like from a work standpoint? What's it look like from a family standpoint? What do we have planned for family vacations? You know, what do we have, you know, how much time do I have off for my hunts? You know, realistically, what should I be holding out for? Because I, you know, last, last year's a perfect example. I had a baby due in late November. I drew a Nevada uh, desert bighorn U or female only tag that opened on October two. And my wife said, that's going to be your last hunt of the year. 
So I knew any hunting I was going to do had to happen between August 1 and October 2. And so it was like, I'm not passing anything. Uh, if it's legal, I'm going to shoot it. And I, you know, I'm going to go on hunts that I think are going to maximize my opportunity. Uh, luckily, I'm flexible with my job. So th- that year, it was kind of like I'd have a hunt plan. I'd look at the forecast and be like, oh, it's going to be really foggy up there. It's not worth going out today. And I just cancel it and go another day. Um, but it, it just turned out to be my most successful season ever. I did three days of bear hunting and shot two bears. And then I did two days of deer hunting and shot a deer and then one day of sheep hunting and I shot a sheep. So four animals and six days of hunting, um, which is hilarious because the year before I really wanted to get a bear and I had a lot of time just to do quick morning or day trips. And I I think I hunted like 18 or 19 days for a bear and I saw some, but I I missed one and I blew, I had another hunter blow a stock on another and that was it. Never got a bear all year long, you know? So some years it works out that way. Some years it doesn't, but you know, this year I'm looking at it, you know, and I talked to my wife and I, I don't think the going out hunting once or twice a week is the best plan with three young kids at home. You know, she's like, it's easier for, she says, it's easier for me if, if you're gone, Hey, you're gonna be gone this week and you're gonna be gone this week. So I have a, a August trip. My brother and I are flying up to Fairbanks, Alaska, and then going caribou hunting up on the hall road. And then I have a November trip to Montana for deer and elk. And in between there, I might get three or four days hunting Washington. So um, I'll decide based off how whether or not I get a caribou in August, how much meat I need for the year. Am I going to be passing on deer, or just you know, and and looking for the biggest a big buck and being okay not getting something, or do I need meat in the freezer? In which case, I'll shoot the first legal buck I see. It just depends on the year. Yeah, that's so cool. I like what you were saying with your wife. Is that you? I my wife's the same way. She's like, okay. I'd rather get in the mental state of you being gone on a trip rather than you playing yo-yo the entire time. Be like, oh, I want to go. Oh, I'm not going to go. Oh, yeah. maybe you'll just, you know, like it's easier on the women when when we can set a plan and, you know, maybe she's like, okay, well, I'm going to go to my parents' house for a little while or that type of thing. Yeah, and, it's, that's- and it's just playing, you know, you, you got to communicate because I, I know other friends whose wives are the exact opposite. Like, I, you know, if you're, as long as you're not gone on weekends uh, and you're not gone overnight, you can take as many days off work as you want, you know? And so they take a lot of just random weekdays off and day hunt, which works great for their family. You know, you got to talk to your wife and figure out what works best for your family for sure. Cause your family has to come first. Yeah, absolutely. So talking about marriage advice, because you know, what I noticed, I, I got into the hunting community through like social media. Mm-hmm. Because I had no mentors, I was able to figure one hunt out, and then from there, connected with Instagram accounts, social media, all this stuff. So all, what I see is mostly like the the twenty to like mid thirty year olds that are on social media a lot of the time. What is it like being a hunter with three kids now, and uh, you know a marriage that you care about and all that. How do you go balancing that? What do you do to prepare with your wife before you're gone? What advice do you have for the people who are married and the people who are single and are going to eventually get to that point? You know, I think it's a great question. And I I've seen personally too many marriages fall apart because of hunting and I get it because it's a huge priority in our lives, and but it takes a ton of time away from our families. And so for, you gotta, you have to have that great communication with your wife and understand it, and then prioritize things correctly. So my priority is always my family first and foremost. So if it's ever a situation, I like this year opening day of high buck hunt, I was planning on being out, and it was a hard. My wife was pregnant. It was a hard day with the kids, and she was like, "You're not leaving today." And I said, "Okay, I'm not leaving today," and. I, <laughs> I was home, you know, I was going to leave, I think, you know, three in the morning, two in the morning to get up before daylight for opening day. And I stayed home with the kids and uh, let my wife have a day off. And then I think I left that night at like after I got the kids to bed and then left after they were in bed and hiked in the dark up to my camp spot, you know, and missed a day of hunting. So it's it's first and foremost, that communication Um, and then just figuring out what works best for your family. And like you said, like we were talking about, it's different for every family. It's different for every schedule. Um, and then for me, it's, you know, hunting ultimately is a selfish pursuit in that, like, I am taking time away from my family and time away from work that I could be spending with my family when I do that. And so my wife and I every year talk about the hunts I have planned, plan them out ahead of time. Uh, and then also like hunting's my priority. I 
do not at any other time of the year go out drinking with the guys or go have poker night. It's not worth it to me. I'd rather spend use my I call it marital capital for hunting as opposed to poker night. Um, I'd rather use, you know, I don't ski season, like some, I used to ski a lot. Now that I have kids, I don't so much, but my friends will go out skiing. Hey, you should come skiing with us. And it's like, if it happens to be a day that my wife's like, Oh yeah, I got other plans. By all means, you should go do that. Then I will. Uh, cause I like it, but <laughs> you got to keep money in the piggy bank yeah. and save it all up for hunting season. And a hundred percent of it is saved up for hunting season for me. Like that's, that's what matters to me. Yeah. Do you plan like date night before you go on these long trips or anything like that? Uh, I mean, we try to do date nights throughout the year, um, but uh, not specifically right before I go on the long trips. But also it's, you know, there's a lot of money invested in hunting too. You know, it's the the gear, the tags, the time off work. And so I make sure that my wife, you know, has, you know, she, she understands that we're fair in that regard, that we're fair in, you know, what we spend on trips. You know, she doesn't necessarily always like going on trips without me. Um, you know, but at least if I'm going to spend, you know, the money I'm spending to go to Alaska this year, I, I sure better have a trip planned with my wife as well. <laughs> so, yep. yeah, no, I totally get it. My wife is, is definitely someone like that, you know, so my, for my 40th, I'm going to turn 36 this year, but in four years, I'm like, I want to go to Alaska and hunt moose. Yeah. You know, but my wife, I'm not, I'm not going to say how old she is, but let's just say a special birthday is this year. And she's like, we're going to Florida. We're going on a cruise. We're going to check out Disney World. I'm like, all right, I dig it. <laughs> but her doing that, she was definitely like, yeah, go go hunt moose. <laughs> you know, so it goes both directions. But I love it. What advice do you have for the people who have little success hunting the backcountry or have not really dived or dove into hunting the backcountry or what what are some of the hurdles in which that you could maybe uh, remove for people by giving them some advice? I think part of it is tenacity. It's, you know, like I said, I think I hunted deer in the Alpine for like 10 years before I ever got my first deer in the Alpine. So it it doesn't come easily necessarily. Um, but it's also don't don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. You know, it's uh, the definition of insanity is right. Doing the same thing over and over again, and expecting different results. So yeah, you may get lucky one of these times, but if it's not working the way you're trying, reevaluate what you're doing, you know, check the terrain, try, you know, try a different access point. You know, it, um, there's, there's ways to have success that are different than maybe what you're doing. Um, it, it's getting out as much as you can, you know, for me, this year was an abnormality, six days of hunting for four animals. So, you know, I said last year, I think I hunted bear 18 days before, and I didn't get a single bear. Um, you know, bear are generally easier than deer, you know, so it's also max, get out as often as you can. Um, I find so often, you know, especially because I, in Washington, I, over the years, historically, but it's still now, I tend to do a lot more day trips. And sometimes you're going to bed at, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock at night going looking at your one o'clock alarm going are you kidding me it's supposed to be pouring down rain tomorrow i'm gonna go hike in and and then every time i do that i think to myself how long have you been looking forward to this day how many months has it been that you've been dreaming about the day that you get to go up in the alpine and be out there so no matter how miserable it's going to be it's still going to be worth it um you know and so i always set that alarm and get out there and do it anyways so it, that tenacity i think really is the is the key Man, that's so cool. That's good to know and good to remember. One of the things that I always like to make sure I tell people, especially that when they're diving into the backcountry, is is start with black bear first. Mm -hmm. Start with alpine bear hunting, and then that will really lower some of the barriers of entrance into the alpine deer hunting. Uh, you're going out in better, better weather, and you're kind of hunting the same areas. It can be a little different, but but it's a great entry. Oh, is that kind of what you experienced as well? Absolutely. I mean, that's why I shot, I mean, I think I've shot, I want to say 17 or 18 bears now, but I think I shot seven or eight alpine bears before I got my first deer because, and like you said, you're hunting the same country. I can't tell you how many times I shot, a like I can think of one bear in particular, we shot a bear and there were seven bucks within view of us as we were gutting the bear. Um, and then the same <laughs> meadow, we went back and hunted that meadow a week and a half later for the opener of archery and missed a you know a huge four point buck with our bows. Um, you know, but you'll find those deer and like, like we talked about, they're not that far away from that spot. You know, they're not going to be in the same spot, you know, 
come high buck or come October deer season, but they're not going to be more than a couple miles away. You know, so if those deer are there and you keep going back there, you're going to, you know, that, that's a good chance of finding, finding some deer in that area. So bears are a great way to get started, to cut your teeth, to find some easier success. Cause like I was saying earlier, you can just kind of cruise ridge tops and you come into a base and you pick up your binoculars, you can glass for two or three minutes. And if there's a bear there, you're probably going to see it because they stick out like a sore thumb um, and go put a stock on. If not, you just go hike to the next basin and try again. Um, yeah. You know, so you, you get to cover a lot of country. They're fun. Um, the meat's great. You know, I, I, I love bear hunting. I, don't, I can't get enough bear hunting. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's a better way to kind of cut your teeth on things. Man, it's my first love. Oh, yeah. I didn't. Now, this sounds like overly cocky or whatever, but I feel like I could go out and fill a black bear tag every year in the in the Alpine backcountry area. And but yet I don't know if I'd ever even see a buck if I go year (laughs) after year. But just because once you know how to find the bears, it you you can get on them as long as you're hunting, you know, August, early September, all that. Yeah, as long, as long as you have a good berry year. What I, I used to think the same thing, and then I learned, well, berry years are different. Some years there's berries everywhere and there's no bears. Other years there's no berries and no bears. Other years there's berries everywhere and there are bears. Other years there's hardly any berries, and but every berry you find has a bear on it. So it, their food source does matter. But, yes, it's, it's certainly a lot easier than deer. Yeah. And it's a great way for all you uh, new hunters is a lot of people have hunted an entire lifetime and never shot a bear. And yet it's one of the the more fun animals to chase in the backcountry. No doubt. Okay. So Shane, in closing, you got to direct people to your awesome YouTube channel and all the wonderful content and media that you put out there. So how does, how do people find you, where to look, all that? Yeah. So I have a website. It's www.lonegoatmedia.com. Uh, that's where I post most of my photography, uh, which I just do as a hobby. Uh, and then my YouTube, uh, if you just search Shane VG on YouTube, you'll find most of my videos or it's literally youtube.com slash Shane M like Matthew VG, Shane M VG, uh, or Instagram is just at lone goat media. And, uh, that's where I share most of my pictures and stuff like that. So any of those places are a great spot to find me. That's awesome. Guys, you got to go check out his content. He's got some killer videos, super, super fun to watch and all that. And actually, I, I'm really hoping to draw spring bear this year. I'm sitting on five points. Last year, my wife was pregnant. And you have a great spring bear video and just totally recommend people checking it out. Yeah, I, I wanted to draw. I, spring bear is one of my favorite hunts because you just don't get out that time of year that often. And so I, my butt, my my uh, son really wants me to draw spring bear this year so that he can come. He can go hunting with me. So I, I put I just put in, I think, Tuesday or something. I put the did the application. So hopefully I draw it this year. Oh, that's so cool. Well, Shane, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Everyone, don't forget to go check out his content and also go check out uh, some of our Hunting 101 co- uh, content along with a lot of other great articles at wabackcountry.com or soulfulhunter.com. But as always, I'm Johnny Mack. Stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com and be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful. Soulful.